We are going through the greatest technological and economic transition in human history, and our political class is totally asleep at the switch about it. It's crazy to me. I mean, it's like an elephant in the um, center of the country just tearing things up and like devastating communities and taking whole like categories of livelihoods and making them obsolete. And our politicians are like, hey, you know, who knows what's going on? Like, I don't know why that happened. Adeo Resi was on our show a couple times, the founder, founder, and student. He calls it the plane. We're all on the plane, and the plane is the pilots have fallen asleep, and we're just you know, chilling on the back of the plane, sipping wine, looking out the window. Oh, it's going down. But some of us, our lenses, our visual, we're able to perceive the plane going down. But we, yeah. And so a lot of the people that are perceiving the plane going down are in New York and uh, SF and LA, Seattle, these different metropolitan hubs, where interestingly enough, you write about it, you know, all these collegiate graduates, people from, and especially from Detroit and Cleveland and Birmingham, these, these central areas in the U.S. as well, myself included from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, I've migrated out to these technological hubs. I want to experience the network effect. I want to be around the leading scientists and entrepreneurs, and that's why I'm here. And we're seeing that migration happen, and these people are now saying, hey, look around you. This is the major time that's coming up. Well, we know it because we're working on it. I have friends who are directly uh, automating away many jobs, they know it, it's in their business plan, they have the line item, they say we're going to save you this much money. Technology often sees human labor as a flaw to be fixed and done away with and ironed out. So it's the people that are working on it or are closest to the scene who will say, look, guys, this is not going to be some gentle transition. Uh, and even if you look at the Industrial Revolution, it had mass riots and violence and uh, popular movements, labor unions came into existence in 1886. Labor Day was inaugurated because of riots that killed dozens of people and caused billions of uh, dollars, of, billions dollars of damage. I mean, that's why they have like Labor Day. It's like, oh snap, like, you know, laborers are freaking revolting. Let's give them a holiday. Uh, and we instituted universal high school in 1911. So and in large part because of a response to what was happening. So the Industrial Revolution was really, really rough. And this time is going to be much, much worse. According to Bain, it's going to require labor absorption at between three and four times the rate of the Industrial Revolution. What does labor absorption mean? Well, what that means is that you have workers who are losing their jobs who manage to find new jobs. Uh, and so the Industrial Revolution, again, massive conflicts and strife. And according to Bain, uh, this time you're going to need to somehow have uh, a reintegration of labor at a much, much higher pace. And if you look at the numbers right now, they're really discouraging because the efficacy rates of government-sponsored retraining are between 0 and 37 percent. Really bad. I mean, 37 is being very, very generous, honestly, because that's just one study said 37 percent of people trained in this industry um, went into that industry. And so some of that would have happened without <laughs> the, the, the retraining, presumably. Um, so we're terrible at retraining. And right now, the rates of Americans moving from one state to another for any reason also at a multi-decade low. So you have a labor market that's not dynamic at all. And then you're saying, hey, it's time to, to, to have a transition happen at four times the rate of the Industrial Revolution. I mean, the odds of that happening um, magically, painlessly, yeah. seamlessly, zero, essentially. Yeah. And, and our government is, again, asleep at the switch where instead yeah. of putting to work massive um, incentives or, or um, really empowering people to be able to adapt. Um, we're just hoping the market figures it out, which it will not. The Freedom Dividend is universal basic income by a different name, just test better. So we're going with the Freedom Dividend. Uh, where every American adult between 18 to 64 gets $1,000 a month. Free and clear, you get it, I get it. It uh, doesn't matter if you're working, how much you make, we don't care. You're a citizen, you're an adult, $1,000 a month. Now, uh, the cost of that is about $2 trillion per year. Now, uh, for reference, our economy is now $19 trillion, and our, it's grown $4 trillion in the last 10 years alone. We are the richest, most advanced society in the history of the world, and we can easily afford 1000 bucks a month. Um, so the federal budget right now is $4 trillion, so $2 trillion seems like a very big ad. But the great thing about it, this is not a government program. It's just uh, circulating money back to citizens so that we can... Uh, buy things for our children, repair our cars, uh, go to school, start a business, whatever we want to do. So the, this $2 trillion 
The way it's broken up is that uh, we currently spend between five and six hundred billion on welfare, income support, disability, etc. Current welfare programs are about five to six hundred billion dollars. Yes. Okay. So if you're going to give everyone a thousand dollars a month, but they're already getting, let's say, a thousand dollars in current benefits, mm -hmm. you're, then you say, okay, you're already getting it. You're set. And, okay. Okay. And so this five to six hundred billion decreases the cost of the freedom dividend by about twenty-five percent. Okay, down to one and a half trillion. Yes. Okay. Now. The uh, the big change you have to make is that right now our income tax system is going to be really terrible at generating revenue from AI software machines because they're going to do more and more work, but the beneficiaries tend to be really big tech companies that don't pay a really high tax rate at all. You wrote in your book that uh, Apple, Microsoft, and Google have tens of billions to hundreds of billions of dollars that they run through offshore <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. To Ireland's a particular favorite. Uh, and so they, they just have all this money parked offshore because they can easily just assign revenue to, to various places. Um, and so even as the big winners in this AI revolution make more money, it's very unlikely that the um, US government or society is gonna see a lot of that. So what we have to do is we have to adopt a value added tax, which is something that every other industrialized country in the world has except for us. So it's us modernizing and getting with the program. And because our economy is so large, a value-added tax at half the average European level would generate about 800 billion in revenue. So Europe's about 20% value-added tax. Yeah, and so and what, at, what does that look like then for like a company like Apple then? That so what would happen is that Apple would be paying uh, a value-added tax at every step of the production process, and then their cost go up by about that amount, total amount. So about 20% more for a MacBook or an iPhone? Well, it would be about 10%, though traditionally companies end up eating some part of that and then passing some of it along to consumers. So it could be that uh, that the price of like you know, the um, iPad or whatever goes up like 8% or something along those lines. But um, keep in mind though, you've got $1,000 extra a month and so has everyone else. And so um, everyone, like the bottom, 94% of the US population will end up with an increase in purchasing power. But then the question then is, if, you, if, if the items are costing more money, if there is that slight inflation yeah. of, the, of the cost of the items, then how much is that offset this $1,000 a month that I'm making? Yeah, it will give me the ability to maybe buy it, but then these normal items like food and water um, and electricity are uh, have they, how much have they went up and how much does that take away from my thousand that I'm earning? Well, it just depends upon how much you consume. And, that, and that's one of the beauties of the system is that the average American is consuming um, nowhere close to the threshold where, the, where, where, where they would lose. Uh, again, the bottom 94% of Americans would see an increase in purchasing power. You need to consume an awful lot in order to, to have the VAT um, be more than a thousand bucks uh, a month. And if you're at that apex of society, um, then that's great. It's great for you. I, even the wealthy people I know, and I do know some wealthy people, uh, they prefer a consumption tax regime to something like a wealth tax or even higher income taxes because they, they, what they'll say is, look, I can control my consumption. I can get a slightly smaller yacht or jet or whatever, uh, but I can't control my wealth. And so if you tax my wealth, it's going to make me really mad. <laughs> mm -hmm. But if you tax my consumption, then I'll be like, yeah, that's fine. Um, and again, every other major industrialized country already has it, some at, ha at twice the level. So this is something that people are very, very accustomed to. So Value-added tax taxes consumption, which is why people are more okay with it. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, value-added tax at half the European level gets you 800 billion. So that plus the okay. 500 billion gets you up to about 1.3 trillion. Uh, out of the, the two. Uh, out of the two. Yeah. Now here's the beauty of it, is that if you give people a thousand bucks a month, they're going to spend it. Right now, 59% of Americans can't afford an unexpected $500 bill. Everyone's really cash strapped and yep. living paycheck to paycheck. So with an extra thousand bucks. Us included support on Patreon.com. The link is below. Yeah, <laughs> support sure. Support Yang 2020. Yeah, I mean, let's do it. It's going to help creatives, artists, entrepreneurs. The Freedom Dividend will be the greatest catalyst to entrepreneurship and creativity in the history of the world. So you put a thousand bucks a month into people's hands, they're gonna spend it, they're gonna create things, and it's going to create four and a half million new jobs and grow the economy by 13% or two and a half trillion, according to the Roosevelt Institute that modeled this out. 
So it's going to be this incredible boom, and the U.S. government gets back uh, about 500 billion of that in new revenue because if the economy booms by two and a half trillion, of course, the government's going to get its fair share. So that gets you up to 90 percent of the cost of the freedom dividend, and then you get the last couple hundred billion from cost savings to health care, incarceration, homelessness services. It gets very expensive when yeah. people hit our institutions. Yeah. Yeah, there's one study that showed that if you give a poor family one dollar, it'll save us seven dollars. So, so, so uh, keeping people functional with a thousand bucks a month actually is going to be this incredible value multiplier. Mental health will improve, graduation rates will rise, uh, nutrition gets better. Like all of these things that will be incredible mm -hmm. value adds. Um, and you know what goes down? Hospital visits, yep. domestic violence criminality, you know, like all of these things. So it pays for itself. Uh, and the, what I'm, I'm suggesting um, isn't even aggressive. Like you could say, hey, we're really going to like create this, map, which we will. Uh, but even if you're conservative, this thing's very affordable. The big problem, and we have a few problems, but like one major problem is that we're guided almost solely by GDP, stock market prices, and profitability. And the issue is that with AI and new technologies, those things are just going to keep on going up and up. Uh, well, not the stock market. I mean, the stock market eventually is not going to stop going up. <laughs> but GDP is going to keep going up um, even as more and more Americans get displaced. You know, I mean, if you have like trucks magically drive themselves, that's like a boon to GDP because you can get the same work done without having to spend all this money <laughs> on humans. Um, but is that going to be good for human well-being? In a lot of communities, it's going to be devastating for human well-being. So we need new measurements that actually correspond to human well-being. Things like uh, median income and wealth, uh, levels of engagement with work, mental health and freedom from substance abuse, childhood success rates, yes. environmental quality, uh, proportion of elderly and quality situations. So you can map these things and say, hey, like, we need to start driving our economy towards human well-being. We need to make the market serve us as opposed to having us all serve the market. Because if it's us all serving the market, we are going to be screwed. Because the market is going to zero out the truck drivers. It's going to zero out the accountants. It's going to zero out a lot of people upcoming. Um, AI is just now hitting a point where it's going to be able to assume the roles of hundreds of thousands of call center workers and bookkeepers and a lot of other things that we have a lot of people doing right now. So, the, so we need to have new measurements for the economy that correspond to our well-being and then start driving in that direction. And the great thing here is that this would free up these corporations to start doing things that help people. Right now, I know CEOs and board members and they say, my hands are tied because I must optimize for one variable. Like shareholder. Yeah, quarterly profitability, shareholder value, like which are tied together. So if there's something else, I can maybe get away with it for like one quarter. If uh, things are going really well, I can like do something on the side and be like, it was good PR. <laughs> but the, so we need to fundamentally change the way that uh, yeah. the goalposts are set up if we want to reorient towards an economy that will serve us in uh, what is, again, the greatest technological shift in human history. Yeah. The realigning of the goalposts is like, right now, this rock is so small, it's just, it just takes 40 days to sail around this rock. And the geopolitical leadership is kind of overthrowing the we are one mentality. And the prioritization of markets is overthrowing the humanity. Yes. And these things being paired together, they're making the goalposts about money and about geopolitical leadership and ownership and, 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 and control and things like that, which I think a lot of people are racing towards. But at the same time, it's putting a back seat on humanity, putting a back seat on the mentality of shifting the goalposts a little bit towards humanity. What would that do? How would that change the world for us? And you know, you're also working on a digital social credit in yes. that direction as well, which, you know, this is another really cool pillar. It acts as kind of, you know, you're doing some tokenomics here. Well, so you have to look at the, the issues on the ground because, you know, as a startup guy, I'm always like, okay, there's like the, the stuff in the boardroom and the, you know, the whiteboard. And then it's like, what's happening on the ground? So what's happening on the ground right now is that, again, more and more American men are leaving the workforce and men tend to deteriorate 
it, without work. Um, we, I'll include myself because you know, I'm a guy and I resemble this. Um, the first thing we tend to do is play a lot of video games. It's like 75% of this now freed up time goes to video games. And this is like a lost meaning or purpose in life. So now what do we turn to? Yeah, if you're just an idle dude, like the, the progression seems to go by the numbers because I'm a very data driven guy. It's a lot of video games, it works well in your 20s, but then you start getting sad in your 30s. And then when you start getting sad in your 30s, you go to drugs, alcohol, um, self-destructive behavior, occasional like violence and criminality, and uh, early death. That's like the, the general progression without work. It sounds fucking horrible. By the numbers, this is a different situation for men and women. Idle women do not uh, disintegrate into antisocial behaviors in the same ways. So you have to look at like the ground floor and say, okay, hundreds of thousands of former truck drivers uh, who now you're saying, okay, here's some money, but that doesn't solve the problem of what, what you do all day because people need structure, fulfillment, yeah. purpose, work. So if we say uh, to the market being like, hey, market, like value these people, um, it's going to be very, very difficult because the market's like, I don't really need these people. Like uh, <laughs> at least the way the monetary market, the way the monetary market set up. So what we have to do is if you have these new goals for the economy, um, then you can say, you know what? If you uh, nurture a child, volunteer in the community, help your neighbor, give someone a ride, repair a boiler, like any of those things that move, move society's goalposts along, like install solar panels, work on infrastructure, um, then we're going to reward you. Time banking. Time banking, yeah. yeah. It's based on a system called time banking that's in effect in a couple hundred communities around the country where if you do something for someone, then you get a time dollar and then you can say, hey, I've got this time dollar, I can give it to you and then um, you have to do something for me. And then people, someone's like, okay. So you create all these touch points in the economy that are independent of skill level. That is just like anyone can show up and staff your garage sale or babysit your kid. Uh, you know, like there are different things that people can do. And then you tokenize those activities, you guarantee it, and as president, I will do this in 2021, you guarantee a monetary value and you say, look, these tokens have real value. Like you bring them to a bank, we'll give you a dollar for every like 10 social credits. Uh, but the beauty of it then is that um, you will tax their redemption and so people will not redeem it very often. They'll, what they'll do is they'll just build social credits and then um, they'll use the social credits with each other. Yep. Um, they'll go to businesses that will be rewarding um, positive behavior and want to be seen as like, hey, like, you know, we love it when people volunteer in the community. So if you come here, social credits, and then they get your credits and trade it to the government. <laughs> so, so there are all these things that can be done. Um, and you can build this parallel economy around pro-social activities um, that's accessible for people at, at every point in the skill ladder. That is the vision. Yeah. That's where we have to go. Because if we listen to the monetary market for too long, they're not going to value these things like volunteering. They're not going to value taking care of kids, taking care of elderly. My wife right now is home with our two boys who are five and two. She works harder than I do. And the, va the market value of her work is zero. Zero. You know? Yeah. And uh, well, I guess technically, if you had to hire somebody else to take care of your two kids during that time, the market value of that would be... 30, 50 bucks an hour or whatever for two kids. Yeah, I mean, you can get nannies and, and, and whatnot, though, you know, there is a difference. Oh, uh, it's like I'd, a parent. I'd, I'd, it's a, it's a, yeah. It's yeah, a and, you know, there, there are many things, too, that are similar. Like, if you, you know, if you, have, um, and if you look at the way, like, the market values, for example, home health care aides, like taking care of your aging parent, you'd be like, oh, I can pay someone to do that. Uh, right now, the market rate for that is $22,000 a year. And there's a turnover of 100%. Like pretty much no one wants to do that job um, of taking care of the elderly. Where, because yeah. we remunerated at very, very low levels. Yeah. And so what, what's happening in a lot of these contexts is you look at it and uh, the market tries to seek like the lowest price point that it can get away with because, you know, and, and, but that causes its own set of problems and friction. So the, the goal for us has to be to, to invigorate some of these activities for a couple of reasons. One, we need them because our society is disintegrating. Like as we're sitting here, labor force participation down, uh, our life expectancy has declined for the last two years because of a surge in suicides and drug overdoses where seven Americans are dying of opiates every this hour. This mental health shit's crazy. Yeah. And it's going to get worse if we don't figure out the automation. How we, yeah, it's, Yes, it's, it's it is all tied automated. together. Yes, yes. Where you have Americans getting pushed into this mindset of scarcity, where they don't have the bandwidth to process things. 
rationally and then they become more impulsive, they make lesser decisions, they get angrier and more like, you know, xenophobic and, and, and the rest of it. I mean, if this sounds familiar, this is exactly what we're going through right now. This is a giant uh, automation story. And so we have to start owning the problem and then have real solutions that are gonna be massive. That's the generational challenge, but that's why I'm running for president to galvanize energy around real solutions instead of the, the garbage stopgaps that are being presented.